<clears throat> so for the next little while, I'm going to clock. I'm going to try and do something I've never done before, and that clock slow. So for the next uh, hour or so, I'm going to not show you any code. Um, but what I am hope to do, <laughs> what I hope to do is give you an idea of what we can do with the tools we have, um, and other groups have developed over the last uh, few years, um, to get you excited about learning how to do it yourself. Um, so the idea is, um, um, no code, not going to teach you how to do this stuff, but give you the idea um, that this stuff is actually kind of fun, and even when it's raw and wiggling. So the hypothesis that um, my group has or that's going to be the um, sort of the underlying the next hour is that automated algorithms have reached a level of development today. Thank you. That uh, automated algorithms have reached uh, level development today that they can match at least and in many cases exceed what you can do by hand. And I'm going to try and demonstrate that through or walk you through kind of some different examples of the kinds of things we can do with automated analysis. Most of these things you're going to then have in the practical laboratories. And then at the end of this session, I'm going to just hammer you again and again and again and again and again, well, eight hammers, um, with the idea that show you how it's actually worked in practicality. So some things that my group has done with these tools to answer real problems on real data and get real manuscripts published. So why should you care? So as you all know, probably, um, flow structure has gotten more complex. So the first paper that was published using flow geometry data analysis tools really in an automated fashion was back in 1985 by Bob Murphy. And he was really excited because he had uh, one sample of three colors and collected 50,000 events. And um, he used a k-means method to analyze that data. Um, kind of simple in his approach and kind of simple in the data. Um, we published a paper last year Analyzing some data from Mario Rotor's lab that had 466 samples, 13 colors, like 400,000 events. So just a huge amount of data has been increased over the last several years. The good news is computers have also increased in power. So in his, he had a, he had a, he talked about, he was describing the instrument that he had, and I went and Googled a picture of it. And this is, this, as you can imagine, back in 1985, these computers were like these huge things, like a big giant chest freezer, and it wasn't very powerful at all. <laughs> Um, the computer that we used to analyze the data last year was seven million times more powerful. You, you have these huge, high-performance computer systems. That's one of the really cool things um, that I'm actually not going to talk about much is the kind of computers that you can use. You all have it using your laptops here, but all the tools that we're using can all be, also be used on these high-performance networks or compu computer resources that you probably have access through through universities. And the way these computer systems usually work is you have many, 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 many CPUs running together. And that works fantastic for flow cytometry data because what you do is you send each flow cytometry data file to a different one of these nodes in these computers. And so the, uh, we had 600 nodes, each with 12 CPUs, and each of those gets one C, uh, FCS file, which is fantastic because even if it, if it takes, you know, maybe two, million, two minutes to analyze one FCS file, when you have 4,000 nodes, you can do a very large experiment in two minutes because they all give you, it's a bit of hand waving there, but. Um, essentially, it gets farmed out really easily. So it's really good, easy to do lots of analysis. But you can also do it on your laptop. But we, are, we really are comparing apples and oranges in terms of both the amount of data that we have today versus yesterday and the computing resources that we had then versus now. And the way people are analyzing all their data now is through manual analysis. And this can be time consuming, especially for discovery. So I, I like to divide the world of analysis for flow geometry data into two parts. One is for diagnosis, and both of these have little bunny fingers on them. Um, one is for diagnosis, and one is for discovery. And so when I say diagnosis through the rest of my talks, what I really mean is that you know what you want to find. So you study this thing for your whole life, and you know that NK cells are the most important thing to, that you have to find for the thing that you're studying. In that case, you want your algorithm to find that population in the same way that you found it from now to the end of time. This, that could be right, it could be wrong, but it's what you want to do, and I'm okay with that. And we have tools that will do that diagnosis thing. The other thing you might want, want, want to do with flow geometry data is do a discovery, and or call, also call it a fishing expedition. 
So you don't know what you want, so you've collected some data and you've got some patients that are sick, some patients that are healthier, some mice that you've done something to and some mice that are controls. And your hypothesis is that there's something going to be different in the flow. You don't know what it is, but if you find it, you get to publish a paper. And so all, what you have in that case is you have labels on your two samples. And what you want to do is you find, you want, what you want to do is find some cell population that best explains that difference. And we have tools that can do that too. But the approaches that you have to do and the way you have to analyze the data are completely different for those two kind of outcomes. So when you're doing this, when you're doing Diagnosis, it's not that hard to do the full structure to gaining because you know you can follow the gaining hierarchy right to that population. So um, intuitively, it's not so bad. Now where it gets to be a bit of a pain in the ass is it can be time consuming, especially when you have a lot of sample variation. And um, you may not want to do that. You may have other things you like to do in your life other than gating. And so the idea is you can have the computers find those cell populations in the same way that you had found it with the same variation. And so you can do the more interesting things, perhaps, that's science. And we also know, even though if you know what it is that you want to find, you know how to find it, there can be, and usually is, significant variability in how you define those populations compared to the person sitting next to you. And papers have shown that if you hand that same FCS file to two experts working in the same lab with the same whip behind them as the PI, they're going to get sometimes different answers, quite often. And sometimes those different differences can be significant and maybe we can make those go away using computers. There's also no really possible way to get p-values out of manual analysis because there's no real statistical underpinnings behind that. You can get p-values on your bar charts at the end after you've done the analysis to compare your two groups, but it's really hard to get any statistical kind of basis on how you're drawing those gates, and we can use math to help us do that when we're doing it on the computer. This is not a new problem. Um, with manual analysis. So when Bob Murphy wrote his paper back in 1985, he was like, OMG, you know, three colors, this is really, really hard. I don't know how anybody could ever do this. I mean, two is easy, but now we're at three. This is really hard. Um, and it's actually, he says that in his paper. Um, but then you can go to the paper that was published uh, a couple years ago when it came up with the mass cytometry. It's like, oh, OMG, 30 colors, this is really hard. You know, how can we ever do this by, by hand? And so this is not a new problem. Um, but the good news is um, some of these tools have been developed to help us solve these problems. So if we're going to use automated tools to do the analysis that we want to do with them, um, what do we have to deal with? Well, there's a large number of events, dimensions, and samples. So the algorithms, you don't want to wait around for a computer. That's just frustrating, right? We, we get so pissed off when, you know, oh, I have to get the new, latest iPhone because you know, it takes an extra 30 seconds to load the web page. We, we're used to have this immediate gratification. So the algorithms have to be quick and fast to be able to handle it, even though you know, it doesn't take, we can farm out to large nodes, we want to be efficient. There's lots of different data formats. So it's not just the FCS files, it's all that other data that you need to have that goes along with those FCS files. And I have to say for our group, time and time and time again, when we're analyzing data sets from different studies and even studies that we're intimately involved with, it's that metadata, the, the data about the FCS files that has been absolutely, positively, without a doubt, the most difficult thing. It's not the analysis. If all the data comes in, and we understand what it is, and all the FCLs are properly annotated, it goes kind of well. The biggest problem, and this is the thing that you're going to have to, I hopefully you remember only one thing um, out of this two-day two session, um, is if you're going to do automated analysis, the more and more effort you can spend on making sure everything is annotated as best you can, it's going to make your whole life easier. Because you're going to be parsing in all this data, and you would be reading in these headers. And uh, what you don't want to be doing is then, after you've automated all this analysis, is sitting there and trying to tweak all this metadata one by one by one by one. You're not winning at that point. And so the more stuff you can do in Excel is fantastic. We work with Excel all the time. It, it's, it's, it can be a great tool to annotate data. So you, you have your SAS files, you read them in, and then what you also have is this Excel spreadsheet that has all that extra information. And you spend a lot of time getting all those columns and rows organized well. And you read that in and you put the two together. And that's a fantastic way to work. But it's getting people to annotate in a structured way has been the biggest difficulty. Um, right now, there's no commercial software that you can go out and buy that solves all these issues. And the nice thing is Paul Robinson published a paper uh, last year that I can use now to quote this, because I believe this my whole life, well, since I started flow structure data analysis, that you can't go and buy something that's going to solve these problems. Sure, sure you can use Flojo, 
it solves some of these or some of these other tools, solves some of these problems, but nothing really solves, nothing you can go out and buy today solves all of them. Um, we did a review back in 2009 that described some of these tools. This is a really good um, paper that just came out um, this year by Noel Namur, someone I used to work with, um, who reviews as well um, all the full geometry R packages that are out there, at least most of them. Uh, Paul Robinson's paper kind of gives you a bigger overview of full geometry data analysis, um, as well as our paper. So um, we didn't want to give you a reading because um, that would kind of spoil the whole story. But um, for backup stuff after you go away, um, I think these are three really good reviews um, for you to, if, you, if you're still excited after two days, you can go read more. So the good news is there's a solution. This is why you're all here. Um, and the solution is R Bioconnector, obviously. So R is, uh, was a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. From the previous slide, when we were talking about metadata, mentioning the structured, structured way of entering it, what do you mean by structured? So, um, so you can use, so the question is, when you talk about structured data, what, what do I mean by that? So people can use Excel for good or for evil. Um, and so one thing I've seen people do <laughs> is, they have, is they have this Excel spreadsheet and they had all this data in there. It was fantastic. Here's all my data in Excel and here's all the information. And then they used color to say, here's all my positive samples, here's all my negative samples. And they used different coloring to describe that. And there's no way to parse out color from Excel. So, stru so structured means um, your rows and columns are consistent in what they describe. That the words you're using so to describe the things don't change. That the labels that you're using, um, you're not messing things up. So one thing we have is file names. So people do we spend so much time parsing file names. You would not believe how such a simple thing can be so complicated. But people use the file names to mean something. And that, that's okay as long as you do that in a consistent way. So you don't change underscores with spaces. You don't change underscores and dashes. This stuff kills you when you're doing, you, you think it's a simple thing, but it absolutely positively will kill you when you're doing automated analysis. Because all of a sudden, you have, it's like um, normal underscore and then something, something, something. And then somebody says it to disease dash something. And you have to spend all this time and you got better things to do. We have better things to do. So being consistent in how you do naming, being consistent in your column names, being consistent on your labeling of um, reagents, how you what you put in the FCS file, pick something and stick with it. And if you change it, then go back and change it for all the other files. Don't leave. Don't in the um, when you say, well, this is a stupid way. Um, I want to change how I'm doing. Then go back and fix everything because you're gonna have to fix it later again anyway. Um, don't pick something that's smart. Don't change it. If you have to change it, make sure you go back and fix everything that's that was done before. Um, changing things just makes it a big headache. Does that answer your question? And don't use color in Excel spreadsheets. This is a really smart person too. It was insane. I, I say that because we spent so much time trying to figure that mess out. Um, so R is um, free. It's free in two senses. Free, it's free in the sense of beer. So here it is. Have a nice beer. Enjoy it. Doesn't cost you anything. Um, it's also free in the sense of um, freedom. Um, it's open source, so you can do with it whatever you want. We show you all the code. Um, if you want to, because you're going to be all super intelligent after this, you can go in and hack all that code and change all that, and then use that within your company or whatever you want to do. It doesn't cost you anything to change that. Um, the only thing is if you then change that and want to give that to somebody else, you have to give that to somebody else under the same conditions that we gave it to you, which means they have to then share all that with everybody else. Um, it works on Mac. Linux and Windows pretty well, um, no problems at all. So we did something, um, we gave you a virtual machine today. Um, the reason we did that, um, maybe two reasons. Um, one is that when I've kind of done this before, we spend, we spend and you can spend a lot of time trying to get things to work. It's, it's difficult the first time when you're trying to get R to work to spend all that time to get it, the whole system up and running and downloading the packages and that can be a bit painful. Um, nothing wrong with that, and it's a great thing to learn. Um, it's a bit intimidating and daunting and might piss you off. You have to do that just to get ready for this workshop. So, But you can very easily install software, and we are going to teach you how to do that, um, at least with one or two packages during this workshop. Um, 
the other thing is one of the, there's one package that we're doing such cutting edge stuff here in the next few days. There is one uh, package that we're just putting into Bioconductor called Flow Density. It's not quite there yet, and so we couldn't do this, um, go download it, and install it uh, in this workshop. So we had to give it to you in this virtual machine. Um, hopefully nobody had any problems installing it. Um, if we do, we'll get to that. Um, but all the software that we, we have developed and all the software I've been talking about is in Bioconductor. And through R, you just type in one word and it'll, or one little line, and it'll basically go and install all that stuff automatically. It's really quite simple to install packages in R. Um, and there's been lots of people who can contributed stuff to this Bioconductor. Uh, it's been widely used um, for lots of different kinds of things. I, um, so R is a statistical programming language at its root. So if you're doing math and stats in some university somewhere, you're probably going to be using R, and they use it for lots of different statistical purposes. Robert Gelman, um, who's doing a lot of development in R um, and others, have developed packages to do bioinformatics analysis. And if you're doing microarray analysis, for example, probably one time or another you've used R, or somebody that you know and love has used R to analyze your data because it's a really good way to do statistical analysis. And same also for um, sequence analysis. And obviously now for R, R sorry for flow. And the, the way that it works, it's a scripted approach. So you're not, you're not gonna have, um, you have a little bit of mouse interaction when you're using something like RStudio, but you're gonna get your fingers dirty on the keyboard. So as biologists, I get that. It's, it's not the way that um, you're used to working with software. But the good news is, um, because it's all written down in a scripted kind of way, um, you can actually see the process that you have to walk through to do the analysis. And when something goes wrong, you have that described in front of you. There's no mouse menus that you have to remember where to click. You, you describe in code um, what you have to do. Um, so it's uh, self-documenting um, what's happened. And this is one thing I really love about computers, and that's actually why I got out of working with mice, is when something goes bad with a mouse, you don't know what it is. You don't know if it's the subway next door being built that the mice got upset. This happened at our center. The mice just aren't having good times because there's a vibration like three blocks away because of the subway being. And shit happens, and you don't know what happened. With code, it's right there in front of you. Um, it may be hard to find, but you can debug it and work it out, and eventually it's black and kind of white. Um, and with a bit of hand-holding, you can usually figure things out. And what, the wonderful thing is with Google now, when you ever have a problem, you just there's going to be 50 people who have the same problem you do. And um, we won't do this today, but um, maybe we will. But if you have a problem, you just take copy that error message, paste it into Google, and usually someone will find that answer. This is what I do in my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> With my spouse, uh, I can't. I can't get the home computer to work. Well, did you try Google? She hates me when I do that. But you know, usually you find the answer. Um, the way it solves um, the problem is we break it into smaller pieces. So, uh, and I'll describe that a bit more on the next slide. Um, but the, the the tools that we develop solve one problem. They solve it really well, and then it goes on to the next step. And another tool is developed. You're not. We're not developing some mammoth program to solve the whole idea. Is here's my data, and I want to do discovery. And this one program does everything. No, we break into quality assurance, gating, transformation, and one tool is doing each of these little steps along the way. It's all open uh, software with open standards, which means it works really good with collaborative development. So this has been developed. Um, we've done a lot of development, but a lot of other people have done development in this area as well. And it all works because it's all open. It's all open source. All these tools work together. It's fantastic. So bioconductor.org to find more information about that. So, lots of software out there for doing data analysis in R. Um, we're not going to talk about all those. Um, the first one that's probably the most important just to get stuff going is Flowcore. It's sort of the basis underlying. We, you couldn't do anything without that because it's the whole way of how to read in your files, process them, do data analysis. You can analyze with Playcore, multi-wall plates, flow utils, does importing, transformation, compensation, quality control. We have some advanced statistical methods. If you're working with large data, it kind of sucks on a laptop. Um, you don't have enough RAM. So, for example, for the workshops uh, studies that we're doing today, it was this HIV data set, but if we gave you that HIV data set and asked you to analyze it on your laptop, you would be sad people. Because you'd be waiting, churning through RAM, because you don't have supercar computers. They are very powerful, but it's not going to be able to turn through 466 samples of 13 color with 400,000 events. It can't be done. But um, if with some tools like NCDF flow, um, you can have all your data sitting on disk, 
but it doesn't have to read the whole thing into RAM. You, you, you're running into issues when you're trying to read too much stuff into RAM at once, like big data files, and your computer will just clog down, and your computer's swapping, and it's not going to run fast. But if you're doing large data analysis using MCDF flow, you can leave your stuff on disk and only read in little bits and snippets at a time. So that really works really well. A qualifier, um, if you work with gated data, you can use that to check to make sure that the gates people have used are sane. We have really cool stuff for visualization because R and Bioconductor are developed for doing other things in flow analysis. And some people have got great ideas on how to visualize data. We can use a lot of that within um, flow cytometry data. We can do make nice plots. Flow Workspace has been a fantastic development. So nothing against Flowjo. Um, we use it all the time. We use it to figure out what people did so we can automate that in R. Um, Flow Workspace will read in your Flowjo workspaces and get them into R so then you can then do more stuff with them. It's a really fantastic tool. Um, I, workspace is coming out of version 10 or version uh, nine, or, 9 or 10. Actually, mo most workspaces now. Um, they, they, they've done a lot of work to make this improve. Flow Trans uh, allows uh, people to do data transformation. Um, Open Cyto is a new tool that Raphael's group um, has just developed. It basically simplifies stuff, so you so you don't have to do as much coding. You can you can use this Excel spreadsheet idea again to help set all the parameters, and you just read in this Excel spreadsheet, and then um, you don't have to remember all the nitty gritty stuff on how R works. You just have to tell it this is what I want it to do. It's a really fantastic development. Most of these, with the ones that stars, have have papers associated with them. Um, they all have vignettes. So vignettes are um, so the peer review to get stuff into Bioconductor involves not only writing the code, but they make you write a description of how that code actually works on a real problem. And so when you go down all these package, you'll you'll find these vignettes that actually um, tell you this is what you have to type in, this is what happens, and this is what it should look like. So all these have that, and since most of the people um, are academics, they all usually have papers associated with them because that's how we get paid. Where the real bang for the buck has been, though, is in gating, because we recognize that as a pain point for you, and it's also kind of cool to solve that kind of problem because it's the kind of thing that statisticians get a kick out of. So and so for these two reasons, there's been a lot of development in R to solve automated gating. Lots of different packages. Um, flow Clust, Flow Merge, Flow Mean, Step Spectral, Flow QB, Flow Peaks, and Flow, uh, flow Peaks, Flow QB, those are all coming out of my group. There's two more. There's one here that we're on, that's not on this list is Flow Density um, because you can't go download it from Biotech today, but we're going to be using it. I think it's fantastic because it actually works. I've been doing this for a while. And this is the first thing that actually seems to be useful that people care about. Um, uh, all these are using all different kinds of approaches. They're all approaching the problem how to do clustering in different kinds of ways. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. So lots of different tools for, for doing data analysis. But data analysis is only the first step. Data analysis only gets you what the cell populations are. It's not asking, answering any questions. It's like, here's all your T cells. doesn't even know what a T cell is. Here's a bunch of dots that came together in the same kind of space. And here's another bunch of dots that came together in high dimensional space. And we think these are two different kinds of things. And that's all. It doesn't answer anybody's question. Flow type and archaeoptimics are two tools that you'll be using during this workshop that actually help you answer, answer some questions on what are the important information bits in this data set. So we have all these tools, but they all fit together in a pipeline. And so the pipeline always starts with compensated data. Um, we kind of assume that you guys know what you're doing up until that point. So you have you have to have you just have to hand off some compensated data. Um, there are some people who are working on tools to help do automated compensation. Wayne Moore um, is one of the I think he's the only guy who's really working a lot in this area. Um, he's got some stuff that kind of is working, but yeah, garbage in, garbage out. So we, we can't we don't we don't help you up until this point. So you've done the appropriate things, you've compensated your data, and here you go, take it away. Um, it works best, usually works best if you do the, I, I won't tell you how to do flow. Um, but do your compensation post-acquisition and store it in this full of our matrix, and it makes our lives much easier. I'm sorry. 
do your do your do your compensation post acquisition and store it in the spillover matrix. Don't try and because it, it's easier for us to because we can fix things then, right? And if you do your compensation and hard code it and um, um, no, just how we're, when when you're doing compensation, don't do it when you're sitting on the machine. It makes our lives and don't don't um, if you do it. Uh, it works much better for us if you have it stored in the spillover matrix and don't store don't store your files compensated because we can never go back. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So as long as you're using FCS free, the data that's going to be read there is going to be raw. But so the compensation is separate. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's Are you talking about the old method of, you know, yeah. or just the compensation? Like yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if anybody does that. We, we, see, we see data sometimes yeah. that is like that, that old data. Hopefully yeah. nobody's doing that anymore. Yes. I think most yeah. of the machines now. Most are of the machines are now. Doing but um, sometimes with these long, we, we do a lot of long term studies, and, and sometimes this old data, it, it becomes a total pain in the ass. I, that's why I didn't, I didn't want to go there, but you mean, sorry, I just, yeah. just stopped that. Anyway, well compensated data, start there, lives me much easier. You guys are all doing that, fantastic. So, um, a few tools. Before even before you even start doing any kind of analysis, you want to make sure that it's not crap. And it's very difficult. And I'll talk about this later to figure out what's crap and what's not because there's no statistical p values just to figure out what something is crap. So what you have to do is visualize your data, and so we have lots of different we have some different ways to help you visualize your data to see if things are going wrong. We can't tell you what's going wrong, or even if it's actually something thing going wrong. But we can play the game of one of these things, but it's not like the other. It's really important to do. Um, you want to normalize your data, so if things are moving around because you've done something in the machines over long-term studies, we can take care of that. Uh, there are ways to get rid of stuff that um, dead cells and debris really easy to do. We do that a lot. So you got some clean data. You can transform it using any of the one of the transformations that you use today in love, logical or X sine H. So you got your transform data, and then it gets fun. Then we have all these different choices on ways to do manual gating. So we have greater than 20 algorithms to do that. Um, at least 14 or 15 of those are in R. So we got our populations. Um, we want to, depending on what you're trying to do here, sometimes it gets tricky for matching populations because, I'll mention this again, um, the algorithms don't know what a T cell is. They don't know what a B cell is. They just have these dots in space. And it becomes tricky when you have one file with here's some dots in space, and you have another file with here are some dots in space, but now these dots are over here. And you can look at that by eye and say, oh, well this one that's over here is the same as this one over here because it's sort of relatively in the same position. Computers, you kind of have to be tricky about that because you know it, what's difficult to know if it's this one is the same one as over here or if it's, it's the same population or is it different. And how we, how we do that in computers is you have to sort of match these and you, so you take, I'll talk a bit more about that, but it gets tricky when you're looking at lots of samples over time to try and make sure to match all those up. But we have some tools to do that. Um, and then it becomes a decision point, are you trying to do discovery or are you are trying to do diagnosis? And there's different kinds of tools and we'll talk about those more in depth uh, both in this talk and you'll be using some of those during your class. And these can, these can swap in and out. So we have different kinds of algorithms you want to use. It's easy now to try one, swap it out, put another one in because all this stuff up to here doesn't change. You're just kind of changing this part after that. You might have to do some kind of different hand waving or massaging to, to do his input to that next step, but usually this works pretty well. Can you go back? Um, so just looking at the slide right now, it looks like there's only two possible transformations. Oh, there's 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 lots, okay. etc. Okay. Sorry, you can use any transformation. We have we have we got them all. Um, parameterization for some of these is more difficult than others. I don't think we're. I don't know if we're going to talk much about the log, logical versus. We're going to talk a little bit about yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about them and how you can do that and some of the conversation, but they're all in there. Um, so this is how you. This is how you work today on, on the left hand side. You're you're using your mouse and you're going file open file compensate, doing a bunch of clicking 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 clicking. This side no clicking, typing. So you have to. You have to so this. Two days from now, this will all make sense. But basically, there's code that you can write 
that does the clicking for you, which is great because then instead of clicking, you can go have lunch with us. Um, so this is a plate core workflow um, we published back in 2009. That just that all, all we're doing is automating what you're doing by hand. Uh, so we're going to use our studio. So there is some clicking. You like clicking? We like clicking. Um, our studio is one tool um, to do the analysis. Um, there's different ways you can interact with R. Um, a lot of people just use the command line. Um, this is a nice graphical user interface that um, you'll learn more about that separates stuff. It's kind of like Flojo. You see pictures, except for this part. That Actually, Flojo does that in the background. You just don't know that. Um, but you can do clicking in here. You can select dots and stuff like that. It's a nice tool to do um, analysis. Um, this is a picture from Noelle's uh, paper. So all, um, for those of you who are working at home, um, all this stuff in our project, um, this is where you go get the stuff. It's statistical programming, lots of different tools to do lots of different st things, most of which you don't care about. Within R, there's a subgenre of stuff for biological analysis. So I talked about microarray sequence analysis. Um, down here on the bottom, high throughput assays, we're, we, we live in here, close atometry data. So you click on that. Um, if you're doing this at home, uh, once you have R installed, this is all you have to type to get access to all the, um, a lot of the software. You just have to say, go get me the bioconductor packages, and it'll go off and run some stuff, and it'll install it for you. It works. They do a lot of stuff in the background, so you don't have to. And if you get stuck, those help. So there's vignettes that describe all these tools. There, we have some example workflows for flow cytometry. So they, uh, some of this stuff is a bit older. Um, and it's, it's hard to know on the internet what's crap and what's not, right? Never try and get a diagnosis <laughs> from the internet. Um, and sometimes never try and get help on flow cytometry analysis from the internet, because sometimes these workshops are better than others. Um, but um, there, there's information there. Um, there's mailing lists, there's facts. You, so the people on mailing lists are really responsive. So um, all the package, oh, most of the package maintainers listen, because you want people to use your stuff, right? And when somebody uses your stuff, you get a kick out of that, and you want to help people use your stuff. That's why I'm here. Um, so the people who wrote these codes tend to sit on the mailing lists, and if they see something go by with a question, they'll tend to answer it that way, um, uh, because we're nice people. And you also can take some courses on how to do more stuff with Biconductor if you want to get into more programming stuff. So this is where Flow lives. There's some examples in here for doing, um, this was written about two or three years ago, but they had the Flow core package there, a lot of the basics. And so this is a different way that you guys can walk through and get reinforced with some of the things that we're going to teach you. Um, Nikesh, not Nikesh, I forget it's a name like that, Nishant. Um, look for the look for the packages that Nishant or the descriptions that Nishant did. They're really really good for how to use flow uh, some of the basic flow packages. Um, they're they're available online. So I described the vignettes. Everyone all the packages have one. They describe the, the basic functionality. Um, they're interactive. So that it's some of the really cool things that you can do in R. For example, is you can write some code that actually writes your paper. And all the code um, in there will generate a PDF. And you can, and this is how all the vignettes are done. The, the PDFs are actually generated by the code that is written. And so if the plots, if the plots in the PDF, you actually see the code that generated those, reads in the FCS file, blah, 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 and that's what the result is. And that's how these vignettes are written. So if you follow the examples uh, and type them in, you should end up with that description as that person described them, because the code actually ma makes that happen. And Easy ways, you just browse the vignette, it opens up in the browser and in our studio, you can see the plain text and the R code alongside that. Um, this is an example package page. So um, we'll be doing this, I think, with um, Archaeoptimix. So you'll learn more about how to actually go through the process of uh, installing the software for the Archaeoptimix example, because that's not installed in your VM, that, uh, the virtual machine that you have. So you basically say, you know, this go get the um, go get that package, and it'll do some stuff in the background. You see some stuff going on, and boom, it's ready for you to use. Um, it's that simple. Um, so all the packages have some basic examples, um, documentations, R scripts associated with them. So this is what the vignettes look like. 
they'll tell you what you do. So this is how you say, I want to use the flow means package. Before you do that, R knows nothing about flow means or Power Connector or R Studio knows nothing about all these tools that are out there because there's thousands of them and doesn't necessarily have all those thousands loaded up on your computer. So you say, I want to use this package. And then now your computer now learns how to run that software. Then it describes what you have to do. You have to read in some data. Here's some different variables you have to do. It tells you what has to happen. This is the plot. Kind of walks through those examples step by step. And we all have papers because we're all scientists. And so this is more of the, the advertisement. Wow, look at this. It actually works and does something neat. So it gives you a bit of more background um, on what it is that we're trying to do with this software and shows you a practical example like a normal paper would without showing all the code because nobody wants to read that in a paper. So now I'm going to walk you through um, all, uh, at least uh, each of these steps one by one, not on one set of code or one set of data, but more generally uh, step by step. So it all starts with making sure your data is not crap. Um, the problem is, how do you detect what's crap or not? There, there's no, these errors you have to fix. Yeah, or at least you don't, you don't have to fix, you have to be aware that something is happening. Because the last thing you want to do, and I have been the supervisor, supervisor of somebody who's done this, man, that's the best way I can say that, is we spent all this time analyzing this data set, uh, trying to understand uh, a cancer data set, trying to predict diffuse large B cell lymphoma. When we did this analysis, it's like, Here's a, here's a cell population that's, that's standing out. Um, you know, these people now look different than everybody else. And what it turned out is that somebody had swapped a laser on the machine. And because we didn't know that, because they didn't annotate their data properly, there's this, this, this thing that was not in the FCS file that this happened on the machine. Um, but they knew that, we didn't, because here's, here's our all data analyzer, right? But all this extra information that was in their head doesn't get put in the FCS file. Again, metadata annotation is really important. All of a sudden, this pop these populations are moving around because of this laser change. And these populations moving around is a difference. But we didn't know that difference was based on time. And that time was all of a sudden this laser swap. And so we saw this different, so we didn't know what that was. But you can visualize these things um, using the flow Q package. So you can get this broad idea of how these samples are looking over time. Um, across, you have to think, you have to, it really depends on what it is you're studying. So I can't tell you how to do that because it's, it's data, de it's experiment dependent. So, but you want to look at your data, you want to explore your data in different ways without, uh, without, before you even do gain, to try and find, use your head, find things that might be different. So plates. So you might want to look at all your plates over time or different plates uh, how these different wells are looking. So there's ways that you can, um, with plate core, you can color all the wells all the, in your 96 well plate according to the, the population density, for example. And if maybe you might want to see that the outside wells look a lot different than the inside wells, would tell you that maybe something is dried out. You can look at forward side scatter, for example. Um, just plot me the average forward side scatter for all the wells. And you'll see that these are the cells on the outside or big and the cells on the inside are small and something's happened to them, they're unhappy and they're blebbing out. But then when all your analysis post that, it's going to be influenced by that and you might be finding well differences rather than biological differences. But there's no p-values associated with that, so you do a lot of exploring based on what's different, one sample or the other. So there's tools to do that, just to explore data. There's two papers that have been published that describe some of this. And we do things like this. Uh, this is basically forward side, um, forward versus side scatter um, on a whole bunch of wells. And you can see these wells are different than these wells. That may be biology. These may be patients that are getting sick, but um, and it may be related to um, the size of those cells. Maybe you know, the patients aren't happy, so the cells are getting bigger or smaller. Um, or maybe because they dried out. You don't know. But at least you identify there's some variations going on here before you actually do any gain. And you can do some statistics to see, actually, is that difference significant or not. There's a really cool, I think it's kind of cool, because uh, it uses the web sort of page. Um, so it's like red light, green light. And so we do some stats stuff in the background. And we, we have some ideas of things that can go wrong. And we, we put those, like the Bible cell count, um, how many cells there are. And then if something doesn't look like everything else is our test, and if something doesn't look like anything else, then you get a red light, and you can click on that and actually show you that data that's behind that. 
We can also do checks of your gates. So you can read in your Flojo template, um, and then it tries to see um, if some samples have proportions that are highly different than other samples. And if the proportions are changing a lot, that might be due to biology, or maybe due because your gates are not in the right spot, and your dots are here, but your gates over here. And uh, so you're going to get a much different count, and it's a flag that um, your counts are a lot uh, are more off than they might be should otherwise. Um, so this is kind of our Rafi Arbery Turtles lab. Uh, just a question about last slide. So you talked about the Flojo templates. Is that the same as Flojo? Yeah. Um, where is the technology at right now to pull in a DEVA experiment or Gallius protocol? So, so, the, so the question is, where, so we can read in Flojo. Uh, can we read in other technologies? Um, so one of the problems, uh, so one of the, one of the nice things that uh, Flojo has done, and they have exposed how their stuff works through XML files. So Flojo writes as workspace, and that workspace is an XML file, and we can parse XML. We can parse anything, um, but we have to know what it is we're parsing. So a company like BD have these Diva workspaces. They don't tell anybody what's in that workspace. There's no um, place that we can go where uh, BD has written down, this is what's in the workspace, this is what each of it means, and effort has to be spent to reverse engineer that. Flojo doesn't tell anybody what they do, and they change what they do, um, but it, much, it was much easier for us to reverse engineer that than it is to do other kinds of software. So everything that we do is open. Everything we do is based on open standards. One of the hats that I wear is I chair um, ISAC's Data Standards Task Force. So we wrote the FCS 3.1 standard, and we, we write it, and we describe it, and we tell you this is what has to go in each spot, and this is what each spot means. And we do that because now all the instrument developers use that same description when they write the FCS file. There is no place where um, there is one now that we just wrote for gating. But right now, nobody's using that because we just developed the standard for it. But there is no, as, a, as an example, there is no standard that describes or that people have implemented, that this, except Flojo is using getting out. I'm getting a bit distracted here. But essentially, there's no place that describes all this other stuff other than the FCS file in an open way that people are all using. So for us as software developers, it's a big pain in the ass to go and reverse engineer um, all these different tools that all these different software developers have done for all the different workspaces. And unless we had a reason to do that, um, because we had some study that we're getting paid to do, we're not really interested in spending the time to do that because that's not very interesting. So no. That that's that's the short answer is no, and that, the long answer is because it sucks and it's not very fun. We can do that if we have to. Um, How long did it take to flow 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 workspace? Um, that was a few I don't know the FT time, but it was like a couple of months of work. And so part of that so, so part of the problem is Flojo is a moving target, so they come up with new versions every time. Every time they come up with a new version, they tend to come up with a new workspace. That's why you can't read in your old template file, right? Same problem for us. But it's even worse for us, because at least they have some, they should have some idea what they've done, but they don't want to spend the time trying to figure it out, and that's why these versions don't work. And for us, it's even worse, because we don't know what the heck they're doing in the first place. Um, but it kind of works now with, this, with the full workspace tool, mostly, kind of but not for anything else. But that's going to be changing. So as I mentioned, so we just came out with a standard called gating ML. We published on that. And right now, we're writing a, a reference implementation in R so that um, all these software developers can see um, how to exchange gates between software tools. And I think this is going to be fantastic. So you could take um, Flojo and then read it in the F, um, uh, FCS Express or read it in the Diva. And so BD has said, yes, we're going to follow this standard. In our next version of software, they're going to follow the gating ML standard. So you can, they'll write out gating ML files. And then you can take those gating ML files that you analyze in Diva and then read them into Flojo, because Flojo already is supporting an early version of um, uh, gating ML. So we're, we're getting there. Things are changing. It takes time, and it's painful. But it's a good time to get into this space, because all, all these problems are being solved. Um, so this is an example of QA with qualifier. Um, so you can basically plot over time proportions that are in each gate. In region your FCS file, you can see um, one of these things is not like the others, and it's even red to show you that it's not like the others. Um, 
We don't know why that is, but the proportions here are much different than the proportions on the other samples. Maybe that's cool for you. Maybe that's the person who's going to die tomorrow. Or maybe because your gate's off on all these and not on this one. Or maybe it's two, maybe it's two populations that are in here. Who knows? Um, is it, has there been enough RBC uh, lysis? Um, these don't look like every other sample. Um, you might want to check those. So again, it depends on what it kind of, you have to, what, what are the questions I'm asking? What are the kinds of things that could go wrong? And you have to write checks for those. This is where being smart about your science um, works in. So this is looking at fluorescent stability over time. You know, you get some out, when you're doing, we do a lot of long-term experiments because um, nothing against R, but it sucks if you're gonna do all this effort for analyzing three samples because you can kind of do that by hand. So when we, try, we, when we tend to analyze data, it tends to be for hundreds or thousands of samples. And so things go wrong over time, right? Something doesn't work that day. You forgot to have your coffee and you forgot to buy pet and some wells. And so you want to check for that. So the question is, um, Expectation about files. So there's no ex one of the problems with doing quality checking is there's no expectations at all. There's, if you have if you have an expectation, you can probably write a statistical test about that because if you have an expectation, that means you have some idea of a distribution. And you have an idea of a distribution, then you can check that check your values against that distribution, and that's how you get p values by expectations. Um, all this stuff, you have no expectations because if you did, you would have a hypothesis. Now you have a hypothesis, you could test that. And if you have a test it, you should have a, 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 some kind of t-test or something you can do. There are no t-tests. Essentially, there is a bit of that going on here, because that's how we figure out what's read. But a lot of it is just visualization of your data, um, big data exploration to try and find things that look wrong, generally. Um, you can write some tests once you know, kind of, here we had some ideas of what to do around. That's how we get the stuff that's read, and how we got p-values. Um, when you're first doing this, you're just looking at data over time, usually. Uh, data anonymization. When, when stuff changes, it gets hard. And so um, one of the things that can change is um, technical variations. So if you changed your lots on your reagents, you ran out of reagent, that happens. But you have a new reagent, and all of a sudden your populations are not like the populations you had before. When doing large studies, you have to account for that. So you have to move stuff back to where it was before, or move them back, or move them back to some common reference. So we have two different tools that we wrote um, to help remove that technical variation. But you have to know it's technical, because if you have some biological variation and you do normalization, all of a sudden you've gotten rid of your sick versus healthy, and that's kind of bad. So um, you want to do that when you know you have to. So you have some, we had some change here that happened to be a laser change. So here, here's the example I talked to you before. This is the same thing as this, but it's not because they changed the laser. All of a sudden, that population is way, way over versus what it was before. But we had to account for that so we can get the labeling right. I'll talk a little bit about labeling later on. Um, so this is kind of how it looks. I'm, again, not showing any code. You have to trust me that the math is really cool. Um, this is what the raw data look like. So here's that population, and here's that other population. They're actually the same thing. We do the math. And now these are lined up on top of each other. We had two different ways, and essentially they work the same way. So this is before, it's just a gamish of all these populations. This one's all the same. But we know that there's two kinds of things going on here, and so it goes, whoop! It's all good. And the cool thing is, this works uh, really well. So this is using Flojo. So here was with the manual gates. So something that people want to do with Flojo is they'll do a, I don't know, it's called painted gate or static gates. And so you, or you find one sample, oh, here's my two populations. And now I have collected another 30 samples. I don't want to get all those by hand one by one by one. So you just take that gate and paste it across all your data. But then your stuff is moving. And so if you use the um, qualifier, you would see that you know, half your samples, the proportions have gotten a lot lower uh, because you're missing all the data up there. Now you normalize your data. The gate's still pasting the same gate across all the samples. Um, but it's going to get the right sample net. Can we write the right spot because we've changed where that data is? So even we're so the question is, how is data normalization um, the more 
simple, straightforward way of how is data normalization a straightforward way of normalizing as opposed to again referencing Plancho um movable things. So that's all we're doing. And so the question is, how, how is this different than moving your gates in Flojo? Um, Flojo, you're doing it by hand. Now, we're not. Uh, well, uh, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, like I'm spinning hours and hours and hours and hours. At the moment, going back and looking at some experiments I did two years ago to try and standardize the gates now that I understand and reanalyze it as it came out. So th th this is, now there's two, there's two reasons why I want to, so two reasons why I want to move the gates. So, uh, we're going to talk a lot about flow density later on. And flow density is, is a tool that we developed that is counting for little minor sample to sample variations. Um, so, so sometimes in, in Flojo you will do some tweaks. So you, you get the gates and you want to twist them a little, uh, uh, twist them a bit because you have sample to sample density variation um, that's small. Um, normalization, you, you have here's a whole bunch of data that looks like this. And then later you have a whole bunch of data that looks like that. So you're trying to move um, gross sets of data. So this is a bit, might be a different, different problem than when you're doing um, just adjusting of gates versus wholesale moving of data. Uh, so we have data transformations. We, we, and we got them all. I want to show a couple here. So transformations is another pain point for us. And absolutely, as you know, or probably know, how you transfer data has a huge impact on everything else you do after. If you don't get your prioritization right on how you do the transformation, everything else is going to fail. So we spend a lot. Of, we spend a lot of time, like you probably spend a lot of time, trying to get those tra transformations right. There is some tools that'll help you do that transformation. Um, and Flowtrans is a package again coming out of Raphael's group that um, does some assumptions or tries some different kinds of assumptions on how to parameterize your transformations. Um, but it still can be a very difficult problem and with automated analysis as it is with manual analysis. So here's an example. I'm using that flow trans package um, before and after. You can see this probably looks a lot more like you would want it to look for, like to look at. Um, and it does, does some cool math in the background to help you try to get things to look right. Automated gating, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, lots of different packages to use. 14 in R. I've talked a little bit more, you know, it's free. Uh, in the sense that it's computer time, not your time. We think it can be more accurate. We can probably find more stuff that you can do by hand because the computers can spend all the time to analyze the data that you might not want to spend all the time, especially when you're doing high dimensional data. There's just so many populations. You don't have all the time to find them. The computer does, and it'll find them all. So you can spend your time doing science. And we talk a lot more about this in module four. Um, excruciating detail about all the different tools there. So I'm not going to talk about that today. That's more for tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Um, labeling, um, trying to trying to figure out um, what samples are the same across large data sets is a problem. Um, so the way we do that right now is here's patient one, here's patient two. Patient one doesn't have any cells up here. Uh, patient two does. But we want to know, and we look at this by, by eye, we can see that these two blue samples are the same, these black ones are the same, and there's no red one over here. But the computer has to learn that. And the way the computer learns that is we take a representative of here, 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 and the represent rep representative is the center of that population. And so we take the centers of all those, put them together, and then we cluster, we do clustering on the centers, and then we say, oh, these three dots are all the same, these three dots are all the same, and these four dots are all the same. And then we map those back to here, and we're able to label those populations as the same. This is something you do in two seconds by eye, but the computer has to do this uh, one by one. Um, so again, just kind of walking through. Once we have those labels, we can map them back. Uh, figure out all the red ones are the same. But um, the algorithm still don't know what a T cell is or what a B cell is. Um, and that becomes really difficult because when you do automated analysis, you're going to find thousands of cell populations. You're going to find three to the number of markers of cell populations. And if you're doing a uh, 10 or more color study, that's tens of thousands of cell populations. And there are going to be immunophenotypes. There are going to be CD3 positive, CD4 positive, CD16 positive, CD28 negative. And when you get these long strings on a, on a sheet of paper, there's nothing that says, this is an NK cell, this is a B cell. This is a, this is a, real, this is a pain point right now for automated analysis. 
is translating the, what the computer spits out in terms of population labels versus biology. And there's no link between what we do and what you do at that point. And this is where um, working with biologists who love you is really important because it's really, really painful. Um, we're working on that. Um, we're, we have some ideas. There's some ways we can solve this problem, and they're not solved yet. And it's not going to be solved in the next couple of months. Even then, it's not going to be solved elegantly. And I'll be talking more about that in Module 6. But this is, this is the problem. It is We find so much stuff, and knowing what's important out of all that stuff requires... This is where it gets to be science again. And this is, where, this is a tricky part. Um, so we, we get to two part, parts here is um, now we got all the subpopulations identified. We're going to need to do diagnosis and discovery. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in module four. Um, but what I am going to talk about now is some examples from my own lab um, where we use these tools to some good success. And the way I measure success is I get a paper out of it. Um, so uh, when I started in this field, uh, developing tools, I thought that I uh, don't know if this is the right thing to do, but get the most complicated data set I could get my hands on. And I thought, if we can analyze this data set and analyze it well, then it's going to work for everything else because we've solved the hardest problem. And so the easy stuff will be easy. But I didn't think it would be useful to solve all the easy, you know, six color data um, because it doesn't necessarily mean it can scale well. And scaling is what you want to make sure that you're, when you're developing tools, it's going to scale to larger data sets. So I talked to Mario Rodero because I. I didn't know anything about flow when I started, but I knew that he was a big guy and he's doing all these papers and doing, you know, pushing the boundaries in terms of data. And he had this, you know, it was a 13 surface markers and KSQ7 set data. So at the time, really, and still is, that's a complicated data set. And it was also a lot of data. They had 466 patients that had HIV. And they had survival time that was measured over that. And the cool thing was they had found something. They had published a paper that said we had found some, some signal and all this data that was important for us to understand HIV. So they, they had a true positive that he had. Um, the bad thing was I had to burn through two graduate students before I actually got something to work. But then I had uh, Nemo. Uh, a lot of the stuff you're seeing today is from a uh, graduate called Nemo. is now working in Gary Nolan's lab. We developed a tool that, would, that solved this problem. But they had found that CD127 positive and CAN67 positive populations had either positive or negative correlation with HIV onset. And so he, they'd done the math and for deep um, who worked with Mario spend, what he tells me is seriously months analyzing this data set to try and find this and looking at all these different cell populations one by one. And it was a total pain in the ass because do all doing it's by hand, right? And trying to tease all this out. But they found something and they got their paper published. They had good p values, you know, uh, p is 0 0.003, 10 to the minus 4, differential survival based on these two populations. So the question that we had is uh, can we develop a tool that can find what they had? Because that's, they found this, we better be able to find that with automated analysis. And the question is, and for the win, can we find more? And I wouldn't be here talking to you about this example if we hadn't done just that. So they found these two populations. Um, through automated analysis, um, and I won't talk to you uh, about how we did this, I'm just trying to get you excited and showing that these tools actually work for reality. Um, we found something that sort of combined these two together. So we take, they found two things by hand, we said, well actually, these are kind of related, these two populations. You can find something that combines those two. So we, we validated that we were able to find what they found, but we found it in a bit better way. And we found two other things. And because we found what they found, and we found these two other things, it makes us feel a bit better about these, because we, we had this one as well. And then they went back and looked, and that those other populations they, that we found actually made sense, and they were very excited about that. So not only that we found, we found it a bit better. And so it's really all about the p-values, right? You, you, you win when you get less than 0 0.05. Now I can publish a paper, right? So they, they, they found uh, 0.003 and 10 to the minus 4 through the power of automated analysis in our biconductor. Uh, we got 10 to the minus 13, so we we're obviously better. Um, and then we found these two other ones with also very high significant p-values, um, these populations, associating with their survival. Um, using the same sort of tools, um, this is an example of an RP optimics plot. So this previous analysis was with, was with flow type. And one of the problems with flow type is there's nothing pretty to look at. It's, you get this string of amino phenotypes in this big long page. Um, that doesn't make anybody happy. It certainly didn't make Mario Rotor happy. Um, now I make pretty pictures with RP optimics. It's one of the tools that uh, we're showing today. It's a great tool for doing um, discovery. It's kind of like Spade. And that it summarizes all your data in one plot. Um, Spade sort of uh, does that without the labels. One of the nice things that we give you is labels on the, on the amino phenotypes. You can't see these. And it says, 
um, C10 positive, CD38 negative. And the color of this dot tells you how important that cell population is to distinguish between your two groups. And in this case, the group was GC lymphoma versus reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. So they, they had a, beforehand this idea that these FCS, pop, these FCS files belong to two different groups. And so here's group one. So give you all, give you all these FCS files, and then give you an Excel spreadsheet that says these FCS files belong to group one, and these FCS files belong to group two. And you pour that into Archaeoptimix and Flowtype, and it spits up this graph saying we found this population in this data that said that best ex that is most associated with the division into these two groups, which is a fantastic tool if that's the kind of question you're trying to answer. And then then you have to go back and go to Flojo and look at those cell populations and actually see if it's actually real. Um, so again, the problem is with an eight color two, we're going to find six thousand cell phenotypes. There's a lot of cell populations in your data that you probably don't know about and don't care about, um, but we're going to find them all. And then the trick is you have to go back and see if it's actually real. So we get this, this is what we spit out. Um, these amino phenotypes hadn't been found by manual analysis. She goes back, does some gating, can find that by hand, so it's actually there, and then looks at the difference between group one and group two. It's like, yeah, your stats actually make sense. So ding, another paper. Um, it's in, that's the paper, and the cool thing was is that idea of that cell population had been written about before in another paper, and now we have something that's submitted, I think, on this. The pa our paper isn't accepted yet, but it will be. And really great specificity and sensitivity on this analysis. Another example, um, this is now in Press and PLOS 1. Um, looking at the difference, the question here is we're going to do lyoplate analysis. So you can take your reagents, uh, dry them down into uh, 96 volt plates, and then the question is, uh, the reason why you're doing this is if you want to do large studies. So if you're doing a large clinical study across nine different centers, you want everybody to, you want to get rid of noise as much as you can when you're doing large studies. And one way you can get rid of noise is by everyone using the same reagents. And so one way you can do that is by giving people lyophilized plates. And so the, the question is then, are these lyophilized reagents working the same as liquid reagents. So here's all your FCS files. Here's labels in Excel spreadsheet. Here's all your samples that are lyophilized. Here's all your samples that are liquid. Is there a difference? Well, yes, there is. IL-10 is different between liquid and lyo. So maybe we, we want to be aware of that. Maybe we want to figure out what's actually going on in here. Is one better than the other? That's kind of up for you guys to understand as biologists. We're just telling you there's a difference here. Um, and it's a very significant one. Uh, and then and you go back again and manually, manually analyze it by hand. And actually, the, the, in the lyo plates, the brightness is actually increased. So it's actually a better reagent, better than liquid. I don't really care. All I care about is our tool worked and find something that the biologists were able to, to validate. Uh, we can also do um, diagnosis. So the question here is, at the cancer disease where I work, um, we're trying to tell people if they're going to die of cancer. And um, you want to do that. Uh, so they do that. That's great. And it works. And people die. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we want to make sure that we want to make sure the diagnosis that we're giving, they want to make sure. No, let me, let me try that again. The powers that be above the clinicians want to make sure the clinicians haven't gotten insane or doing some kind of crazy diagnosis, right? So we've had some cases here in Canada where, at least in radiology, that some guy isn't doing his job right, and then it gets the paper, and they have to rescreen 900 patients because this guy isn't doing a very good job. And so the routine standard of care is that um, they are supposed to do um, a random review of about 1% of cases. Um, that's what I was told. I, people have to come to us with their problems. We just solve them. And so Andrew's Wang problem, Andrew, Andy Wang's problem, was a collaborator in this project, says, i got to review all these cases. That, that sucks. And it's also kind of a waste of time because I'm just going to pull out some random case and reanalyze that. And I might not find the one that's actually important. Can you help me in this problem? And so the hypothesis that we had is we'll use computers to identify those cases that are most interesting for reevaluation. So how, how do we do that? Well, we train a computer to do what Andy was doing. And then we reanalyze all his data. And then if the computer is trained very well, it should get the same answer. If it doesn't get the same answer, that means Andy's gone insane, or it's a problem sample, or 
who knows, or our algorithm sucks. That'll never happen. But at least it's, it's pulling up problem cases for him that are at least informative. And so um, we, we can do stuff like clustering, and we can find populations, and we can train. I'm not talking about the classifier that we developed. I don't think we're talking a lot about classifiers in this, but there's a lot of statistics you can do that we're not talking about that are outside of analyzing flow structure data. So a lot of what we're talking about over the next few days is the nitty gritty of how to do read in an FCS file, the nitty gritty of how to do population matching. But there's all the statistics that comes after that, like how do you do classification, how do you do t-tests, how do you um, look for differences. So we can do that here. So we've developed a classifier um, to tell the difference between diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. We found two different ways to do that. And then what we did is combine those two ways. So some of these, one of those methods got some patients wrong. Uh, prediction and actual. So some of these, one algorithm got these guys wrong. The other algorithm got these guys wrong. Well, it looks like it's the combination of those. Well, here's four, four patients that they, both algorithms agreed that you said it was this, we say it's that. What up? And it turns out when we went through those cases, um, they were re-reviewed by a pathologist. In each case, there is some underlying reason why it's either not quite diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, it's not quite uh, follicular lymphoma, or um, maybe something has gone wrong with a diagnosis before. The reason why something has gone wrong with the diagnosis before, because they don't just look at flow. They have all this other information they're collecting about these patients. And so the diagnosis that's in the, the computer is based on all this other information all this other metadata that we don't have, because all we have is the flow. So we could, we, could, we could have incorporated all that other information that they had done on those patients, other kinds of studies. And you can do that too, if you have other, you know, once you've gotten the flow data, uh, if you have microarray data, if you have sequence data, if you have clinical outcome data, you can combine all these different milieus together. Uh, we're just talking about flow. Uh, we didn't have access to that information, but you know, if we had that, we probably could have got these more correct. But at least based on the flow alone, these were incorrect diagnosis. So it's a win. It works. So going back to that, when I validate the last um, or have valid assays, um, we have to do calculations for precision and accuracy. Right? Where we need to look at positives and positive positives and positives. Um, is do any do the fact that we're just looking does that help give me a number? Yeah, so so this this gives so we we so here, so this is all sensitive so this gives you the idea of uh, what the sensitivity and specificity of your assay is. So we, we have so this is built into these tools. So we, we have an idea of how well they're work, how well they're working. Um, all all the uh, Archaeoptimics plots are all based on area under the curve analysis. So we we, we have these are all key value everything everything. Um, everything we can I say everything we do is based on statistics? Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's all based on statistics. Yeah. It's how you define, you define them to do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. What's, I, your, what's your level of confidence that everything you do is based on statistics? Well, I'm trying try to think of because yeah. well, some, some of the stuff is. So where does statistics end? It's math and stats, where you draw that line is. So all, when we're making diagnoses and, uh, or doing discovery, all this is based on p-values. So this, this, is, this is essentially a p-value plot. And so these, these are, and all this stuff is based on statistics in the sense that we had to come up with some cutoffs, some thresholds that allowed us to make that separation between uh, group one and group two. Um, some of the, some of how we do these thresholds sometimes uh, can be a bit arbitrary. That we're trying to find the best separator, um, but I would like to say that there's a lot of, and I haven't shown you any of the math and stats behind that because that, that's not the place for this. But all 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 this is all built on statistics. I guess is the best answer. I'm almost done. That I have, I just have four more. I'm on example five. Example five is really short. Because somebody came to us with a hypothesis that Parkinson's disease can be distinguished based on flow. I believed him. He was really excited. Um, turns out that's not the case. So we did all this analysis. We didn't find anything. I didn't find anything either, he says. So the tools that we use um, don't spit out 
in, in our hands, all the data sets we've analyzed, we've never had a false positive, which is great because you don't want to do all this analysis and spend your time. It's so hard doing biology. You don't want to spend your whole life trying to understand something that we spit out um, by automated analysis when that's just crap. And so because it's all based on statistics, we have really good um, uh, positive predictive value. We had really bad positive predictive value and negative predictive value. It wasn't performing very well. The good news is we're not going to tell you something is useful when in fact actually it's not. Uh, example six. Uh, two more examples. Six, seven, eight. A few more examples to go. Three minutes. I can do this. Um, standardizing data across large centers. Very important. Um, the more you guys can do to standardize your data, the better, the more happy we're going to be. So a bunch of people got together, decided that we understand immunology, and we understand that T cells are important, we understand that NK cells are important, we know everything that's going to be important for immunology from now to that time, at least in eight colors. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those reagents, we're going to dry them down because um, standing variability can be a big problem with large clinical studies. Lyophilization should help that. Cryopization should solve that. Really great paper that explains why this all makes sense um, that Holden Maker published last year in Nature Views of Immunology. But if we do all that, we know, or Holden knows, because he published a paper on this, very famous in 2005, that you give a whole bunch of labs some data, you have a whole bunch of people analyze that data, and they get some variation and how that data was analyzed when I do it by hand. And these are not idiots. These are all smart people that grow at MIT and Harvard. You give that same data set to one guy, much smaller CVs. Now, you could be wrong, but at least he's wrong in a consistent way. And that's sometimes a good thing. So the CVs have gone 55 to 24%. So huge variation in how manual gating can be done when you use one versus many gators. So the idea is we automate the process of finding all these cell populations. So they listed out all these. So this is a diagnosis problem. Find all these, find them in the same way that we did by hand. So this is where the flow density tool comes in that you'll be using today. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you today about the math, but it kind of looks like what you do in flow gel. Um, it's putting gates in the right spots for B cells, memory B cells, transitional B cells. It's putting them in the right spots because you told us what to do. Does it work? Of course it does, because otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about it. So some examples here, comparing manual versus automated analysis. Manual on the left, automated on the right. Um, some examples of things that are perhaps easy to find. So, so one thing that tends not to be easy to for these different algorithms to find is rare cells that are off in the space. There's a couple dots that are separated from these other dots, but there's a mish. There's, there's no line that makes any statistical sense. This is, this is what I was kind of hedging on this, what, what's done by statistics, this is the example I was thinking of. There's no reason why the line is here versus here versus here. There's, there's no math that says this is the cut that has to be made. There's nothing in, in the density distribution that says that's where it's going to be. You, as a biologist, says this is where the line is, and this is where it always has been, and this is where it always shall be. That's your way to make diagnosis. Sometimes, in other examples, they have that, but for, for this particular monocyte population, we have no explanation for why they do what they do. But you tell us what to do, we can do that really well. Um, same thing for here. There's no, there's nothing in the data that supports exactly why that should be here on here, which is a little switch up. But you tell, you give us some rules. We're really good at following rules. So computers follow rules really well. That's what they do. So we can follow that rule. Um, we get the same answer. Uh, again, and again, and again, and again, and again. All these different populations. These transitionals are another really tricky one. We, we had developed three tools for three different um, data sets trying to find, everyone's really interested in transitional cells. I don't know why. But it sucks because it's really hard to get that gate right. Until you tell us exactly how to do that, then we have no problem. So this is, so I showed you some examples. Now I put all those examples together. So this is the manual analysis on all that data on average for a whole bunch of data sets. This is the automated analysis on the right hand column for all these different different uh, for these series of different populations, uh, six different populations. And for the win, we are within the variation you would have got with manual analysis, with the automated analysis. That's what they wanted. And um, we're not finding something else, we're finding the same thing we did, and which is why I'm so excited about this flow density package that we'll be talking about tomorrow. Uh, second last example, um, three different patient categories, healthy, 
So it's a big type of cancer, some other disease. I can't tell you anything about this because this is from a company um, that has two letters in its name. Um, and so the question was, can we use flow density to follow the gating hierarchy um, and bend them? Uh, so they had some gating hierarchy here. Um, we knew that they wanted to find uh, blast random sites. And then the question is, uh, they had other disease. Um, so again, we're using the flow density package. Gate these samples one by one by one. Gate on distribution. And then the question is, we built a classifier after that so we can find all these populations. And then uh, can we find, do we make the same diagnosis that they made on a test set? Um, we got some wrong, but um, what they didn't tell us is that um, here's a bunch of samples that are uh, blood samples, and then we're going to sneak in a few bone marrow samples in here as well. And funnily enough, bone marrow looks different than blood, and so we're, we're, we're kind of diagnosing bone versus blood. Um, but we got most of them right. Uh, the last example is with the mouse, International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. I'm really excited about this because they're screwed. Um, they're going to have 20,000 lines, two ma females, one male, one male. They're knocking out um, every gene in the mouse genome over the next five years. They're going to have uh, two um, 10 to 12 dimensional data sets for 60,000 mice. That's 120,000 SES files. That's a lot of data. Um, they don't really want to gate that by hand. So the question is, um, they had some humans, uh, circles, gate their data, um, flow density, gate the data. Uh, we are within the variation that they see by hand. And not only that, when they ha when looked at what that, he that one human was doing, what that one human was doing, it's like it's kind of off what the other human was doing um, based on our analysis. And then they were able to look at what we, how we automated that process and said, oh, actually, I was kind of doing it wrong. This is 1035. Not too bad. I'm okay. You, got, you, you kind of took up a bit more time at the beginning with that whole, yeah, I'm important. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> um, this, I'm just a spokes model for lots of different people. Uh, and so all this was started with Robert Gentleman, who basically wrote R, and I was so lucky to have him involved from the beginning in my, on my first grant to basically build the infrastructure within Bioconductor and R. Um, I didn't talk about FullCap today. Uh, that's, that'll be for more tomorrow, but I showed some of that data. HIV was done with Mario Roder, g phone with Fiona Craig, the Fuselage b on phone with Andrew Wang, Parkinson's disease with Harvard Gentleman, uh, funding lots of different people.